Um, I hope you've all had a chance to, to look, uh, survey um, the, the, the gallery, but also get really close to some of the works, because they are works that just keep on giving and giving and giving. Um, many of you will have questions already um, about the, the subject works, how they're made, what's, uh, what they say about you know, the technology, AI and art at the moment. Um, and all of these topics will be um, covered in the course of this evening. Um, so um, I will keep it very brief. Um, I'll give an overview of what to expect in the next hour, hour and 15. Um, and I'll then introduce our panellists um, and then we'll launch in. Um, I'll start by addressing one question to each of the panellists. Um, there'll be a bit of a, a longer answer from each of them, just so we uh, get to know their specialties, get to know them and um, their perspectives on, on the show, on the artworks. Um, and then we'll launch into a more of a free-form <coughs> discussion um, between, uh, between the, the speakers on uncharted territory, so we'll see where that leads us. Um, and then at the end, um, maybe after sort of 45, 50 minutes, um, we'll open up to the floor, um, hopefully lots of burning questions. Um, and uh, yeah, so hopefully all, all enjoyable um, and fascinating. And at the end, we'll stick around for 10 or 15 minutes more, allow everyone to have another look um, with sort of refreshed and um, energised minds and ideas. Um, and, uh, and also we'll be around if you want to ask any of us um, questions one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, without further ado, um, I'll introduce our panellists. Here we've got uh, Dan Ambrosi, the artist next to me. Um, we have Arthur I. Miller at the middle and Steffi Shields and me at the end. So, Dan Ambrosi is a California-based visual artist specialising in digital art and AI augmented art. He studied at Cornell University, where he received a Bachelor of Architecture and a Master's in 3D Graphics. During the 40 years since graduating, he's practiced digital art, and starting in 2015, with engineering assistance from Joseph Smart at Google and Chris Snow at NVIDIA, developed an enhanced version of Google's Deep Dream technology that has allowed him to, allowed him to create his large-scale immersive dreamscape series. Ambrosi's practice is deeply informed by the history of landscape painting, fun finding particular inspiration in the works of landscape artists of the 18th and 19th century Europe and the late 19th century Hudson River School artists. Dan's works have been shown in exhibitions and art fairs across the United States and in Europe. His work has recently been acquired by the Museum of Te Contemporary Digital Art. I think we might have a few representatives uh, here tonight with us. Um, and in 2019, he was a finalist of the Lumen Prize for Art and Technology. And this is Daniel's first solo show in the United Kingdom. And now on to Arthur. Arthur I. Miller is Emeritus Professor of, his, of the History of Philosophy and Science at University College London. His critically acclaimed books include the Pulitzer Prize nominated Einstein for Castle, Space, Time, and Beauty That Causes Havoc, Empire of the Stars, Friendship, Obsession, and Portrayal in the Quest of Black Holes, and Colliding Worlds, How Cutting Edge Science is Redefining Contemporary Art. A regular broadcaster and lecturer, he has judged art competitions, curated exhibitions on art and science, and writes for The Guardian, New York Times, Scientific American, Wired, and Nautilus. His most recent book, The Artist in the Machine, The World of AI-Powered Creativity, explores, explores AI and creativity in art, literature, and music. Arthur has also recently written a play, Synchronicity, which recreates the explosive encounters between the analyst Carl Jung and the recent <coughs> brilliant young physicist Wolfgang Pauli. And last but very much not least, Stephen Shields MD is a garden photographer, writer, and historic <coughs> landscape consultant. She is a member of Garden Digital <coughs> and Professional Gardeners Photographers Association and for many years a Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education tutor. Steffi is the author of Moving Heaven and Earth, Capability, Brown's Gift of Landscape, published in 2016, and was advisor to both the National 2016 Capability Brown Tercentenary Festival and the More For TV series Ditch Marsh on Capability Brown. In the same year, she was co-curator with Hal Mogridge, I believe, who I might believe, who I believe might also be in the body this evening, um, of the contemporary photography exhibition Lenses on a Landscape Genius, Lancelot Capability Brown. A Vice President of the Gardens Trust and Chairman of the Lincolnshire Gardens Trust, in 2018, Steffi received an MBE for Services to Conservation and Heritage. Right, so I think it's uh, going to be a good evening with all those accolades and amazing, um, amazing experience and skills. Um, so, I'll start by... Oh, no, 
much, Mr. Pinter. So I'm asking um, Daniel um, an introductory question. Hopefully just to, to sort of bring everyone into the room and situate um, this exhibition. Um, so before we actually delve into the details um, of how these are to end, would you please tell us a little bit more about your motivations behind this show and by, behind your Dreamscapes um, project more broadly? Um, and then after doing that, will you talk a little bit, just briefly, about how the artworks have been made? Because I think that will really illuminate the conversation going forward if we can delve into, to, into it. Sure. Um, so the motivation behind this entire project, which really in earnest has been about 12 years since I had my first technological breakthrough, one of two key breakthroughs that made this work possible. Um, I can recount to you in very simple terms, and it sounds really direct and logical and linear, but as science types know from people that write science papers, they look really logical. There's an abstract, and then it explains we did this, this, that, and that, we concluded this, and that's the end of the story. Um, the actual research usually takes a much more circuitous, crazy path. Uh, in hindsight, I can tell you it was not as straightforward as this, but essentially, I did not set out to be an artist, I just set out as a lover of nature and, and an avid hiker and skier and traveler. And I have this thing that happens to me when I'm in great places, special places. Certain scenes just set my brain on fire. Uh, they come together in a way that I, I just, it sends me and, and, and I feel compelled to want to try to share it with someone else. And I found that traditional photography just wasn't cutting it. This powerful landscape experience that happens in a four-dimensional you know, time and space, trying to get that across in 2D is a very tough challenge. And I do have a design background in architecture and um, you know, computer graphics, 3D graphics. I've got some chops to bring to bear. So over time, I experimented with things like panoramic photography, HDR, high dynamic range photography, and so on. And um, started to have little breakthroughs individually and, and also started to look at master landscape paintings, which some of which that I've always been enamored by, start to get across that feeling that, that reminds me of what it was like being in these places. And I realized over time, in a very circuitous path, that landscape experiences, powerful landscape experiences are not just seen. You feel them and they make you think. And the great master landscape painters knew this. Peter Paul Rubens even talked about this very early, back in the you know, first half of the 1600s before landscape painting really became a thing. Um, you can read that. He, he had that sense, too, that, that, that to get that feeling across, you've got to make something that moves people, not just visually, but also viscerally. You feel it in your chest, you go, <gasps> you know, it makes you feel something. And at least for me, when I'm in a place powerful enough to do that, I start waxing philosophical. <laughs> I start thinking, like, wow, I, you know, how does my dog see this? Um, you know, what is the nature of seeing? What's real anyway? You know, I, you know, so it starts to make you think. So I realized that if I'm to convey that experience as fully as I can, I've got to find a way to do that, to create landscape images that make people feel and think, not just see. Um, so obviously, transmuting or translating a, a four-dimensional experience into, two, into a two-dimensional image requires, in my estimation, a couple of things. It requires a point of view, balance, and uh, it really requires the use of visual metaphors to get across this thinking thing. Um, so 12 years ago, I had my first of two breakthroughs, which was this photographic method I came up with, a computational photography method of stitching and blending multiple photos into one scene. This is now I'm getting into the how do we do this. Um, I call it XYZ photography. In one of the papers that you can find at the desk, you'll see this diagram of the, 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 this cubic array of images, whereby I shoot multiple views horizontally and vertically and multiple exposures deep. 
Technically, these are called the multi-row high dynamic range panoramas. I was not the first person to ever do them. I did come up with it independently, but I'm probably one of the few photographers that is dedicated to this technique, because quite frankly, as while it's simple in principle, the devil's in the details, it's a giant pain in the ass. Uh, so not too many people pursue it. Um, and from all accounts, I, that got me two thirds of the way there. I started creating images, even when printed not overly large. Um, the wide angle view uh, and the fact that it kind of gave you the look of this vibrancy, at least the way I see things, it's actually kind of the way the pre-Raphaelite painters painted as well. Um, think about cameras versus human eyes. We see with an incredibly wide field of view. You know, if you hold your, if you look straight ahead and hold your hands out, you can see and wiggle your fingers, it's like 170 degrees, 90 degrees vertically. Um, we don't have a problem seeing details in shadow and in bright lights at the same time. Uh, and if you have healthy eyes, everywhere you look, you can see rich detail. Um, so I started getting the response that, <gasps> and people would literally, they would take in their breath and it feels like I can walk right into the scene. So, I guess I sort of started to feel like I got two-thirds of the way there, and over a period of about four or five years, I started shooting everything with this technique, trying to figure out what it was good for, and how to refine it, and um, developing this, this process of making landscape images that made you feel something. And then, in the summer of 2015, Google releases this bit of open source software called Deep Dream. Um, now, unlike the AI software that's all the rage right now that's causing all the controversy where it's uh, created to make art and trained on other people's art, this was not that. Uh, Deep Dream, it's not even fair to say it was an Im image recognition tool. It was a diagnostic tool to understand how their image recognition AI was working. One of the engineers was developing this image recognition AI, which was supposed to classify images. You know, Google's a search engine. So they had their Google Photos application that they wanted to get out into the market. And because they're Google, they want people to be able to upload their photos and for it to automatically say, oh, that's Edmundo in his gallery in London on this day. Boom, just like that. Um, and they were getting weird results. Things weren't coming out quite right. Um, so this engineer was puzzling over this and he was actually living in somewhere in Austria, I think, at the time. In the middle of the night, the story goes, he heard a noise, he thought there was a burglar in the apartment or whatever. He woke up, looked around, everything was cool, and he started thinking about this idea, oh, I could actually look under the hood of this AI by reversing the process. And instead of trying to get the answer, I could feed it you know, noise and see what it comes up with. Um, literally reversing the, the typical AI process and outputting an intermediary step. And when he did that, it was very easy, a quick diagnostic trick. Uh, the images that popped out were very hallucinogenic and revealed a phenomenon of human perception and probably other animals called pareidolia, which is this perceptual phenomenon that we evolved to basically keep us from being eaten. When you see rabbits in the clouds or, you know, a shape in the, in the trees. Um, that's for a reason, you know. It, it's better that you should think you see a tiger in the grass and be wrong <laughs> than to not see a tiger in the grass. This whole pareidolia would kind of make that stuff happen in our brain. Um, and it appeared that this AI was doing that, that it was hallucinating. And he thought it was cool, and because Google was Google, they just released it to, to the world. And for one summer, I don't know how many of you remember this, back in 2015, it went viral. And people all over the world had a fun time for a couple months turning their family photos into psychedelic nightmares. Everyone had a good laugh, and it kind of disappeared. Um, I, on the other hand, sensed an opportunity to maybe introduce a cognitive element to my landscape images and make them make people wonder what they were looking at by using it with a subtler touch. And I used some, it could only work on very low resolution images, but I, I passed some low resolution images up to this web app using, uh, powered by Deep Dream. And uh, the results were like very well received. I, I was even amazed. They, 
it just seemed like the 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 mashup between the oddly distorted, vibrant panoramas I was putting together and this weird hallucinogenic style was greater than the sum of the parts. It was really kind of interesting. And, and I got great response, and I was like, man, if only I could scale this thing up to work on my 500 megapixel images, I, you know, I could maybe do something really cool. And while I used to code back in graduate school, that was 40 years ago, there's no way I was going to do that. I didn't have the wherewithal. But when you live and work near Silicon Valley, you know some really smart people. And one of them was a guy I worked with before who lived in my neighborhood. I knew he could, he could make this happen. So I hope I'm not going on too long. I'm almost, I'm, 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 we're going to wrap it up. I know. We're going to wrap it up right now. So basically, I caught Joseph coming out of a bar with just the right amount of beer to entertain my proposition. I said, dude, if you can scale this up uh, to work on my giant images, um, I could lend you my ski house in for, for a week. And, um, <laughs> like, Whatever, just send me an email. So anyway, he got the email, shared it inside Google. They went viral inside Google. Everyone was like, wow, so I was finally using Deep Dream for artistic purposes. <coughs> he got excited, they got excited roped in his brilliant friend to help him, and six months later, they gave me the keys to the kingdom, and the rest is history. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and, and we'll touch, we'll come maybe to some examples of, of the uses of that um, later on in the sure. um, And but I think it's, it's probably useful for everyone in here to hold in mind that um, this is the AI tool. The different patterns you see is what um, has transformed these you know, conversational photography um, into these kind of surreal, um, images which keep giving and giving the closer you get. And there are also two different versions of that that we might want to later. Yes. Um, but thank you. I think sure. Everyone now has a little bit of a better idea of, of, of how these <laughs> artworks are produced. Um, so next, I'm going to come to Stephanie. Um, and obviously, one part of this show is about AI art and this is AI augmented art form. Um, but another very profound and um, fundamental part is, is large scale capability around um, as a subject. So as, as one of the leading world experts, um, I wonder if you could just give us a bit of um, background to, to who um, Lancelot Brown was, um, how he has shaped England uh, that we know today, how maybe he remains in the zeitgeist, um, and um, also any features here in our, Daniel's artworks that um, are particularly uh, powerful for you related to Brown's work. Helen, you're asking me to go from surreal May I back 250 years or more, I think it was, uh, 300 years when he was born up in Northumberland. And um, it is surreal to be sitting here surrounded by uh, the, the works of a man who lived uh, 300 years ago and uh, uh, worked 200 years ago within these settings. And, and so much has uh, been, uh, what is key to this exhibition is that so much survives. And um, the, the joy of landscape can be shared through this new way of taking it. And, and yet, what he was about is, is exactly the same. It's the joy of landscape and understanding how it changes lives. And it wasn't really, he didn't start off life as a landscape architect. He, he was the son of a, of a yeoman farmer who's, who died when he was four. So he was brought up really under the mantle of, of a, a very gifted uh, lawyer and member of parliament who was doing a lot of stuff on his estate. And he and his brothers uh, left school and were employed on the estate. And uh, his older brother was the estate manager. And so uh, what was Brown going to be doing? His other brother was a mason. And uh, well, you're looking at what he was doing. He was learning about water and levels. And the, the control of water and the control of land and levels. Mm -hmm. uh, in a very much uh, 
a um, practical way uh, because people needed to exist up in Northumberland and uh, if, if you haven't been up to Northumberland, go because it hasn't changed much out in the country from the landscapes that he enjoyed as a child. And part of me, having walked the ground with him all these years, feels that he was actually trying to convey some of the joy of his own landscapes. And it was Winston Churchill who grew up there, as we can see, who said, the landscapes we create for ourselves do more than we realize to, to form ourselves, to create our, ourselves. And we know what happened to Winston. And um, it, it's extraordinary um, that everyone in this room will have m memories of these landscapes, some of these landscapes, and will have been there. And your own home. And, and this man got around me. He was a polymath. And he, there was a, an act of parliament that meant that he left Lincolnshire when he, he his the owner of the estate was in his 80s, and he wasn't really doing as much. And Brown was asthmatic, so working up to doors was good. And there was this act of parliament calling for engineers in Lincolnshire. And that's how he came south. Then move on, just a year or two, but then there's a terrible winter. And the old column at Stowe, over there behind you, his dam has given way that, Ken, uh, that uh, Henry Kent has been working on, and he needs a man in a hurry. And Brown is sent for. He was working at the time at Grimsthorpe for the largest estate in the country, the Joseph Banks' grandfather, who was a wheeler dealer and did a lot in uh, the Fens. And that's what they were about. They were about drainage and the problem of solving the problems of farmland and estate land and drainage. And so Brown gets to Stowe and <coughs> the, the, the rest is history really because he solves problems, dam problem, he brings a carpenter and a plumber from Broomsthorpe and he gets going. And then his patron, Banks and the Duke of Ancaster at Grimsthorpe, both die. And the head gardener at Stowe had committed suicide. And his steward ran off with the money. And Lord Cobham meets a man who can. <coughs> and if anything what capability Brown was, he was a young man who could. He learned from everyone he came in contact with, and he was a leader of men, even in his early 20s. There's a chap at, at Wisley, if I'm going on too long, you, you will stop me. Mm -hmm. But there is a chap today at Wisley, at RHS Wisley, called Matthew Cottage. He looks about, well, he looks about, when I first saw him, he looks about 16, he looks about 20 now, but he's probably near, near 40. But he's got 30 men and women looking so that he looks after at Wisley, and he's transformed the place. He's doing projects, creating visitor centres, redoing the gardens, and he's, he, this is another capability. And I use this photograph of him when I'm talking about him because he has that force of personality. When Matthew Pottage comes into the room, you know about it, and that's the same with Brown. And, and it was this that couch shape which ended up it, it made him living. It was Horace Walpole, who the, 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 the gossip commentator, who, who liked to go around and stay with people and gossip about other people, what they were doing in improving their estates. Uh, improvement was the name of the game at that time. Everyone was, was trying to improve things. And it wasn't really about art and aesthetics. Although some of the wealthy landowners had the art on their wall, they had the, the Claudes and the, 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 uh, um, uh, the Frenchmen. <laughs> 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 
Um, and so uh, Brown was able to look at those lovely paintings and get ideas, I'm sure. But really, uh, it was from the ground up and learning at Stowe. For 10 years, he was given the job as head gardener and steward, and uh, he, he uh, that was then such a great history. But it was, it was um, Horace Walpole who, who, who was talking about Mr. Brown, and of course you can imagine that everyone was called Mr. So and so, Mr. Well, which Mr. Brown are you talking about? Well, Mr. Capability Brown, that one, because that was a word he used when he bombed up uh, to Chatsworth and said, what do you need doing? And the owner said, well, what do you think I need doing? And he said, well, give me a day and I'll ride around and come back to you. So he would ride around and he would take it all in, in a, a but they say his eye was as quick as Daniel's eye, <laughs> because believe me, what he's done here is unbelievably quick to, to have achieved. And um, he came back and he said, well, it has its capabilities for improvement. <laughs> and, and of course, by that stage, he knew how to do the water, but he learned from Kent, who worked there. Bridgman van, but you name it. And because something like Chatsworth, which is, is one of the most outstanding properties um, in, in England, how much would you have changed? So you went from a sort of formal garden, did you? And then well, you can still see, see the one behind us and, and above the fireplace then. Yes. But the main uh, focus for him was the river mm -hmm. to begin with, and uh, just to uh, aggrandize the, the river and solve their plumbing problems in the house probably and things like that. And then he's looking at the landscapes and <coughs> considerably uh, changing them in his mind's eye, little by little. He brought his son-in-law in to help him. He's changing the roads, the way you approach, then Payne is building the bridge over. And then the horizon is as far as the horizon, so you can see some of that planting uh, is, is still Brownian and uh, in, in the distance. He takes you to the far horizon and, um, and lots in between. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Thanks for that overview. Um, and now we'll start to try to sort of um, merge them a bit together, these very two contrasting worlds, um, by coming to Arthur. Um, so I wonder, Arthur, in response um, to Daniel's works, the works in this exhibition, um, and in the context of your research uh, into machine learning and creativity, um, could you say a few words about your thoughts? Well, absolutely. Come back to the present, going to the future too. Uh, first of all, uh, who thought that uh, there could be anything new in Deep Dream, something which has been around since 2015, and which has been superseded many times by algorithms that, that generate images? And then Daniel came along. Now, uh, before Daniel, DD, <laughs> before Daniel, uh, Deep Dream was used to generate trippy images. By trippy images, I mean images that are fantastical, that fantasy science fiction, and which rightly turn the world of AI created art on its head. Now, Daniel's ingenious take on Deep Dream was to feed it photographs, photographs of landscapes. And this, this exhibition, photographs of landscapes that had been painted by uh, Capability Brown, uh, and explore how uh, Deep Dream interprets these images. And it turns out that, uh, in, in this case, Deep Dream uh, generates pleasant-looking, realistic images, but with an interesting turn. Now, there are two kinds of creativity going on here. One is human creativity, the creativity of Daniel, in creating the photographic images, which is no mean task claim and use the term aptly computational photography. The, the second creativity is, occurs after Daniel feeds the photographs to Deep Dream, which runs on an artificial neural network, and the machine takes over. The machine becomes creative. Now, uh, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, there are algorithms for recognizing faces and objects, but Deep Dream generates what might not be there. And by that I mean that if you go out on a clear night and you look up the moon, stare at 
there long enough to see a face on the moon, a man on the moon. You look at a complex uh, cloud constellation. You look at it long enough, you may see birds, uh, dogs, uh, automobiles, what have you. These are called pareidolia, as, as Daniel mentioned. And what essentially happens here is that your perceptual <coughs> system is faked out by what, by what you're looking at. Now, when Deep Dream uh, looks at the, the photographs that Daniel took, uh, it, for example, fixates on a tree. And back there is a nice example of one on the back of the column, where the, the machine uh, looked at the tree and saw in the tree swirls. Now, we don't see swirls, but the machine sees swirls. The machines can see what we cannot see. And it's, it's just like uh, uh, AI art is art as seen through the eyes of a machine. So the, the machine looks at these swirls and uh, emphasizes them, and by an iterative process, builds them up to look like as if they were uh, formed not by paint very delicately on a brush, but with a, a palette knife. And so in this way, we may say that the machine takes us beyond the imagination of uh, capability graph. And what we also see going on here is a collaboration between artists and machine, with each one bootstrapping the other's creativity. And I, I think there will come a time when, but I know there will come a time, when the human is not necessarily in the loop. The machines will produce, will be created from end to end, will wake up in the morning and say, I think I'd like to paint that, that, that mansion. Um, and, uh, but what may happen in the future, when this when machines become created from end to end, is that they may have to explain their art to us humans. Okay, but by that time, what it means to be human will have dramatically changed because we're merging with machines. On that happy. Wow, yeah, that's um, <laughs> quite uh, simple, but interesting. Um, and I think what you say about the relationship between man machine um, and also nature really is something that it's fascinating to think about um, because, of course, you know, Daniel, you're working as man with AI machine and based on, on nature. In the same way that Capability Graph was man working with machine, whether that be actually sort of other man power or <coughs> mechanical um, machinery, and with with, the na with nature. Um, and I, I think it's um, it's interesting to draw parallels, particularly in the unpredictable bits of the AI um, it, its output. Um, and perhaps the unpredictable bits of nature and how nature is then, you know, maybe in, part, in places are shaped the landscape and in places not. Um, and I, I wonder the symbiosis between the three. Stan, do you have some thoughts about when you're there in the landscape? And do you have an idea about how the three operate in, in coherency? Um, so when I'm there, I'm mainly driven by that sight, that generates that feeling and those philosophical musings. musings. Um, the process of then, you know, merging the photography with the AI, I can set the direction in which my AI dreams, but I can't control the details. Um, and that's where it really surprises and delights me. It feels more like I'm the leader of a jazz band, and this isn't my virtuoso saxophonist who's going to improvise. Knows where I'm going with the song, but is going to surprise and delight me. Um, so part of the process of working with the AI is at least at low resolution, twiddling the knobs and figuring out which dreaming layers and parameters in, uh, in, uh, that control the scale and the intensity of the dreams generate that feeling that I had or, or... And are there examples in the show that um, you can account that you have a certain feeling or, or moment and that dictated the kind of dreaming? Yeah, the, the strongest example for sure is Stourhead, which is the 12-footer in the other room. Um, when I got to that location, uh, first thing in the morning, there was nobody else there and it's beautiful landscape, just almost amazingly perfectly composed. But it was shrouded in mist. It was really ethereal. And I knew I had to wait for that mist to clear some before I shot it. So I decided to circumnavigate the lake and just 
visit the various architectural follies and take it in and enjoy it. And there was literally no one there. It was very serene and quiet and still. And it literally felt like walking around in a dream. Um, so I really wanted to convey that feeling. So the particular dreaming style that I went for in that piece is very, if you take a close up look at it, it's very flowy and mellow and smooth, which is kind of how it felt to me. So, you know, that process is, is uh, you know, looking at all these alternatives, and since my quad GPU compute server on the Amazon Cloud that I'm using gives me the ability to experiment with four tests at a time, I can very quickly look at, like, typically 12 to 24 different options to try to see if I'm getting where I want to be. Um, and, uh, and then once I find the thing that I think the style that is most compatible, not just with the underlying source photography, but also with how I felt, then I can commit to the large job, which can take overnight. It's, it's um, a typical single pass dreaming on a scene like this. Uh, my engineer, Chris Lamb from NVIDIA, uh, calculated was probably performing, on average, 150 quadrillion floating point math operations per scene. Uh, so it's very computer intensive. But uh, I think what's <clears throat> crucial there is that, is that you are the, you are still the artist who is deciding. You have that creative instinct of deciding which style of dreaming, and that's something other that you would think at some point. You said in your um, your uh, introduction that um, there will be a time when machines when, when machines don't need that, and, mm -hmm. and and do you think that will change <clears throat> how humans perceive art? Um, of that sort, will, will there still be value? Um, this is sort of related, I guess, to questions that you may have about AI and art today. Um, AI generated art versus standard, which is AI uh, augmented art. One of, the, one of the things we have to get used to to appreciate AI art is to appreciate uh, art that has been made by a machine, that we know has been made by a machine. And uh, our notion of art uh, will change as we change as humans, as I said, we will be transformed over the years and we get closer and closer to the machines. And so our perceptions will change as well. And, uh, and finally, the art that machines produce, machine machines, there'll be some stuff from us left over also. In fact, I think there'll be three strands there uh, of art. There'll be art done by people using paintbrushes on a canvas, and they'll eventually go away. <laughs> and then the guy uh, of uh, people collaborating with machines. And machines will extend their creativity uh, because a machine's creativity is unlimited. Oh, it's, oh, it's unlimited. And then finally, when we have machines working end to end, there will be an art that we presently cannot conceive of. We're very, and machines may have to explain it to us. And by that time, machines will be not just clunky things with years and others, but they will have a totally different architecture. And so perhaps uh, a different uh, uh, consciousness and emotions uh, than, than we have. And so they'll produce a different art. And just um, from a point of clarification, when you say creativity, for those of you who haven't read um, Arthur's recent book, you define creativity as producing new ideas with existing? Well, producing, uh, well, it's a two-step definition of producing. In short, producing new works from already existing knowledge. And this is done by problem solving, and we need a model for problem solving, which I have in, in my book. And then there are uh, indicators of creativity, such as uh, 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 surprise, novel, complex. And those are very subjective, so they have to be handled with care. And then there are characteristics of creativity. Amongst them are competitiveness, uh, emotions, awareness, uh, suffering. 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 <laughs> And machines will suffer. Suffering is important. Uh, and these are human characteristics of creativity. I contend that machines will eventually have human characteristics of creativity. And so be creative like us. And will indeed go beyond our creativity. And uh, artificial general intelligence is when machines are as smart as us. And then if they can just a short hop and skip to artificial super intelligence, then machines will be much, much smarter. Um, uh, I'll go back to the 18th century, I think, now. Um, <laughs> so to say, um, and, and we also been talking a lot about machines in the you know, 21st century. And I wonder if, um, 
in the same way that there are you know, sort of criticisms of AI and, and fears and what, were there at the same time naysayers about what Cape Dennis Brown was talking about? Yes, yes, he had his competitors. Um, uh, and uh, I think t today, just to bring it back to today, uh, people look at Brown and, 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 and the yawn sometimes, they just say, well, trees, water, grass, what else, you know? Uh, and they really are not understanding uh, his holistic view. That man was, uh, he ate, um, uh, lived, slept, improvement. He wanted to improve. to attract a team of people that he worked with loyally and, um, and let them sprinkle around the countryside with the different estates and said, I'll be back in six months to see how you're getting on. We'll refine what he's doing. And, uh, and so every six months he would swan up and do it. And he had that same ambition that you're talking about technologically and machines, the ambition of the future. He had that ambition because, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he was invited across to Ireland and he said, I haven't finished England yet. <laughs> <laughs> he did dream big. And um, so getting to be the Royal Gardener was, was key to his professional practice. And he's still gone on the road, even though the king expected him to be there when he wanted him. Brown was on the road working as well. Oh, pilots. Um, and I think also what's interesting is, is you know, people are questioning him, saying what you were doing, what you're changing, such fundamental bits of the landscape. Um, but of course now when we look around, we look at these works, we, we're in the landscapes themselves, the real places, and we do feel this, this overarching, over, overwhelming sense of, of beauty and splendour. Um, learning and the human use of our own emotive learning um, and our perceptions of beauty that you might think um, the college world um, so the thing that comes to mind when you're asking that question is one of the key things I'm trying to say with this project, which is that the world is not what we see, it's the way we see. And the AI basically, especially being part of an image recognition system, has a different way of seeing the world. And, um, and that's part of the way in which I'm using a visual metaphor to shake my viewers and say, you know, um, think about this. We, we see with very specific sets of goggles, and, you know, as a species, we probably share a lot of similar, I, I would imagine, I can't peek inside your brains, but I suspect you see the world kind of in some way that, that I do. Uh, but the machine doesn't, it sees it very differently. And uh, the other thing I'm trying to say, which, if you don't mind me talking about, leads to the way in which this exhibition is structured, is that no matter how deeply you look, there's more. Uh, when I'm walking around in nature, and it could be a fairly mundane park, um, just the sheer variety of plantings and, and richness that's in our world, uh, it boggles my mind. I see infinity in every leaf of every tree, and it just, you know, you know that the deeper you look, the more there's, there is to see. Uh, so in terms of trying to get that point across, world isn't what you see, it's the, it's the way you see, and no matter how deeply you look, there's always more. I structured these 12 uh, artworks into six pairs. Uh, so just so you know, um, these are paired together, those are paired together, these are paired together, and so on. And uh, to make my point about this recursion, <coughs> this, this, this fractal-like depth thing, you'll notice that 
each of the pairs, the big horizontal lit light box landscapes start with a drainage <coughs> style that is quite fine. From a distance, these look like photos. You get up close, you see that they're not. And that particular motif that's used, that I've settled on for this uh, landscape is scaled up by a factor of three and put into its pair, which then gives it space to inject a second style of dreaming at a finer scale uh, to make that point that the deeper you look, the more you see. Um, now, in five of the six cases, those are two different styles of dreaming at two different scales. Um, I also learned over time, just through experimenting, that it could also be the same style at a different scale. This particular one, I tried and tried and tried diff a different style for the fine scale within those swirls and all, and it was just screwing up the main scale. Uh, so I just I realized, oh, I could use the same style, and it, it's like a true recursion, a true nesting, of the same thing, uh, which is a lot of what, the way nature often works that way. A mountain looks like a hillside, which looks like the boulders, which look like the rocks, and so on. Uh, so that's what's happening there. Um, the other thing about setting up the pairs is I also wanted to use the opportunity with a space this big and the opportunity to show this many uh, landscapes is that they don't have to be backlit. I love backlit pieces because the world is, you know, light is the is, is, is primary and um, it, you know, it illuminates and shines through. Um, but the artworks themselves don't have to be backlit to pop. Um, with traditional art lighting, if you don't want to electrify your artwork, you can have a thinner profile and light things traditionally. So there was a practical aspect to setting them up this way as well. But artistically, it's really my attempt to, sh to, to get across that point. The world is the way you see, and the deeper you look, the more you see. That's great. Um, and I think with perception as well, I wonder, Arthur, if you could, um, with your extensive research into these things, uh, regarding machine learning, I wonder if looking at these works around us, what do they tell us about how, not only about how we see the world, but how, how AI sees the world, and can we learn something as well about you know, our, our own neurons and, and how we process images um, from, from the deep dream um, and the patterns around it? Uh, well, we, we learn, machines, machine learning is similar to the way we learn from, we learn from uh, taking the phenomena around us and then we build, uh, we encounter situations with data and we deal with those situations. That means that building what's called mental models. And the whole conglomeration of mental models forms our consciousness because we can able to lift these mental models away from physical surroundings and abstract them. Um, with the um, and, and how how will deep dream people or, or rather AI in general? you say um, will actually go then to the super intelligence, will they be able to use more of that? Oh, yes, okay, models sorry, sorry. Uh, or, we, or yeah, we, we build better models, uh, but machines, personally, uh, find it difficult to build better models in, in that we have to input algorithms into them uh, in order to deal with uh, phenomena in the world in which machines live. But machines will get to a point where uh, they will be able to build their own algorithms in other words, uh, propagate themselves, so to speak, and in that way be able to deal with more and more phenomena as, as they move along. Uh, as for uh, looking at objects of this sort, well, machines will develop a sense of beauty because they can, first of all, uh, they'll be able to read the web better and better, and they'll become, uh, soon machines will be fluent in language and be able to truly read the web and convince themselves and us that they have uh, emotions, for example, and proceed from there. I just want to inter interject uh, something about this. The neural network that Deep Dream is using is very much a simplified version of our own. It's built in a similar way. And what I think is interesting about what Arthur is saying is that as it develops and surpasses us, it will drift into a whole other way of doing right. things. 
What I find extraordinary with the way these things turn out and surprise me sometimes is you will see sometimes in the same artwork motifs that channel Monet or Seurat or Klimt or Dali uh, in, in one image. And this was not an AI that was created to make art. It was not trained on art. That, to me, is an indication that there is some similarity in the way these things are structured. Uh, and I think that leads to this, this sort of visualization of the machine that's not that much different from how these visionary artists that I just named also saw the world. I think it has to do with a semi-shared architecture at this point. Right. But that may someday <laughs> surpass and drift into a whole other way. Well, looking at the, the generative AIs that exist now, like ChatGPT and GPT-4, uh, one gets the feeling that there's more in these machines, because they are artificial neural networks, there's more in these machines than probabilities and numbers. I mean, we are machines. Straight. We're, we're biological machines. Uh, we take in food, we, our organs take nutrients out of the food, and what we don't use comes out the other end. Just like, just like a, a sophisticated earthworm, so to speak. And uh, so uh, there's reason to believe that there's more uh, in, our, in our brains than probabilities and numbers. Similarly, to, there's more we can believe uh, what GPT-4 and the very generative AI is doing it, uh, it's really amazing. They can solve problems in, in physics, mathematics, psychology, uh, and so on. And so they, there's no reason to believe that they, they, that they, they do not think and that we're on the way to artificial general intelligence. But they won't see the little glove. What? They won't see the little glove. The nature's got its own networks, hasn't it? The little glove. That's very nice. Yeah. They're also machines. A tree, a tree is a giant yes, water bottle. Okay. Pumps water up to its it trunk, takes out nutrients, that does photosynthesis and so on. And it's sometimes its leaves smell nice. That's a, that's a secondary quality. Just like a secondary quality for us as a machine emerges such such things as creativity. That's a virtual quality. I want to say, um, with Daniel's point and your explanation that when with these artworks are trying to um, encourage them to look again and again and see more. Is there, uh, are there any elements that surprise you about these artworks or anything you thought afresh regarding these landscapes that you know so well? Uh, it's been extraordinary. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know these uh, artworks. And, and uh, they do draw you in. I, I, I've only come today to see them for the first time. But obviously, I've seen them at, at, at home on a computer. And um, at first, there's, I'm familiar with the places, so it, there's nothing particularly fresh. But then I was thinking, um, I, I started asking Daniel a few questions, and I discovered that he only had uh, virtually uh, a, a month to, to, to photograph these. And I'm thinking, how how did he actually get around physically these uh, uh, 10, 12, uh, uh, 10, 10 locations, 10 locations, 10 locations. eight days of shooting, and it rained almost all and time. One, <laughs> and, and I think the thing that, that, that really uh, attracted me more than anything was his uh, reaction to uh, the sense of place, uh, the, the place making that Brown had made, uh, that, that he had gone to Blenheim with lousy weather, I believe, and uh, had left stones here around just about where you're sitting so that he could take that view if the light improved. And he went on his way exploring and seeing what else might be worth photographing. And as soon as the, suddenly the clouds drifted and the sun came out, and he rushed back to where he left the stones and took this fabulous photograph. But he didn't know that where he was taking the photograph 
was virtually the spot where you're sitting was where Brown wanted to build a bathhouse. <laughs> and Rosamond's Bower to take in the view. It was a lovely place that would attract the owners of the house to come out and take a walk. But they would also, in going to Rosamond's Bower, they'd be linking back to Henry, I can't remember which Henry it was, Henry II and, and his love for Rosamond. And so he was bringing romance and drama into a, into a scene. So this is what he was, I mean, he, by this time, he was friends with David Garrick, so he was very much into Shakespeare and all those lovely stories. And, and, and so he, he, he just took from everything that he could. Um, but that Daniel found that spot mm -hmm. is what blew me away. So then I began to look at the other works, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the journey. Well, I think we, we all have. Um, and I wonder if that's actually a lovely note to open to the floor. Unless there's any final thoughts from the time of before we start um, asking questions. Um, thank you very much for, for, for fascinating the session so far. Um, are there any questions um, as, as some technical? Yes. Can I just say that just so happens, because I've spotted them, that there are two expert brown people here. <laughs> Once Johnny Phillips right there in the centre, whose idea of the whole festival of uh, King Lizzie Brown in 2016, he got that off the ground for the whole country to celebrate King Lizzie Brown. And it's lovely to see you, Johnny. And, <laughs> and, and he, will, he will ask the questions to the cows come home on <laughs> King Lizzie Brown. But also, um, just as marvellous, we have Helen Mockridge how Mockridge is the landscape architect who was commissioned back in the 80s to restore Lenin. If I could say something about this photograph. Yes, please do. Says, this photograph was said in one photograph. It was what I did. This tree is dying in 50 or 10 or some other years it will be gone. Mm. And here you have a group of new trees which we planted with the 11th Duke where trees had been and they had gone. And here we have two little curtains of views where trees had come in obscured the views that Brown made so we took away trees. Mm -hmm. So this photograph, and, but Brown actually, had a single tree here to diminish the power of the building and give more force to the distant view. And they didn't replant it when he died about 30 years ago. But uh, this photograph, for me, is so wonderful because it, it sort of says what I was trying to do and they're sort of growing now, these trees. <laughs> <coughs> oh, it's lovely to you, Sarah. And I hope you, you feel, I feel the joy of the landscape. And that the, the, these photographs do um, do justice. Um, I, just, I do want to clarify that this photograph is actually 36 photograph. <laughs> so it's been blended together. It's six views wide by two views high by three exposures deep. So it's almost 210 degrees of horizontal view and some 70 or so vertically. Um, just to, and that's why you can make it so high res because it's, it's a lot of photos all together. But that takes into account that Brown made landscapes you move through. Right. So in one photograph, you've also somehow got this movement through it, and yet it's just there as one image. Yeah. I mean, this is the way we see it. We kind of yeah. see it that way. And I think also, what Joy said, what I love as well is, is the little little figures you know, scattered mm -hmm. throughout all the works that, that make us feel we really are there. And we've got our own memories of it, you know, as children or as adults or whenever we, we may have visited. Um, and despite the AI's dreaming, the figures are always clear. They always can just make them out. Yeah, let me make a point about that. Uh, you know, when I first talked to a photographer, you, uh, a friend of mine, about what I was planning to do, he, he, he said, oh, you mean like a Photoshop filter? I'm like, no. <laughs> this is way more sophisticated than a Photoshop filter because it's an image recognition system. It refuses to lose the details. 
So even while the nominal size of one of the hallucinations might be a quarter inch by a quarter inch, much finer details retain themselves. Mm -hmm. So you look at this one where the dreaming is about that size. Along the palace, you'll see the tiniest little people. You can see the color of their clothes and everything all still there. All the individual grasses are there. All the twigs and the trees are still there. If the AI didn't do that, None of us would be in this room tonight. <laughs> it's a real gift. Um, can I ask? Can I? Yeah, of course. Um, first off, I'd like, I mean, uh, I know it's what I want to ask, but I'd like to just uh, do an attack on this idea that AI art is going to take over. The first one is obvious thing is that. AI is a long way away from that. You're sure from creating landscapes. Only the 2D images are one thing, but actual landscape mm -hmm. is another thing. But the other thing is what what makes these landscapes great landscapes above all is that in the 18th century the aristocracy was fabulously wealthy. They had loads of money. And what makes art is money. And if you can produce <laughs> art 10 to the second, it has no value. And therefore, art will always be something that, that, that has a financial return, I, su I submit. And therefore, no matter how clever AI gets, all it will do is cheapen or remove or put art in converted commas or something. Because somehow or other, you want art to be unique, to be yours, and to be something that you can value and can sell in the garden. Well, you, what, what you were saying was said about photography in 1838. Well, thanks. But the other thing that strikes me about the, um, the photographs, to, to those of us who know these landscapes, the photographs are amazingly close to the kind of photographs you would find if you went on to the Blending website. You probably see a picture like that, because it is a famous picture. So it's almost as if that one is in all the, in the, in all the pictures, the picture of uh, the Palladium Bridge of Stowe, is, you see it again and again. This one is more or less on the cover of my book. <laughs> um, and, and what impresses me about that is if the site, if to some extent the site was chosen by AI or by your thinking about what you're doing, um, it seems in every case, I think, to have selected a building. And the building is more or less the focus. And, the buildings are not grand. They were there already. And if we just look at this landscape, in terms of what, what Brown did, he did the lake, sure. But he, this, is, this is a great cutting here that he made. Do you see that going down and coming up? And then this bit here is his, is his drive, OK? So this is, this is the detail. It, 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 what AI, what artificial intelligence should be reaching for is an understanding of things like this. This, this curve, and the reason why this curve is here, as Hal was saying, this was Rosalind's well here, yeah, the view back, but, but the money got spent not in the view to the house, but in the view from the house. And if you look at Chatsworth, the whole photograph shows is behind the house, showing the house here. Brown's masterpiece, and it is a masterpiece, is, is to be seen from the West Terrace of the and is this piece at the back. Mm -hmm. And so what, to me, this is, this is almost what the, the horrors of AI. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask is a that, question on that? No. Um, yeah. Daniel, what you're doing is so very different from the sort of photography that we've been witnessing through sure. ChatGPT, Dali, et cetera. Right. And I just wondered if there is a frustration that sometimes people lump these things together and they they sort of see AI and they, they don't understand necessarily that you're kind of hoping them to dance. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point because I, the way I like to explain it is that the use of AI in art really falls on a spectrum. And it's amazing how different artists, where they lie on that spectrum. And Heather Scholl right back there from NVIDIA, uh, who's run the AI art gallery there, has. Um, done a fabulous job of curating multiple shows with multiple artists, and you could, 
maybe it would be something that's interesting to do someday is to put them on this spectrum, which goes from AI augmented art or human AI hybrid art to AI generated art, which is like the latest promptography. And in between, there's all these things like, like people that are training the AI on their own art or on very small data sets. People like Helena Saren and uh, David Young and so on, and there's all these ranges. I'm definitely far on the human AI hybrid or um, AI augmented side, where it really is kind of like a 50-50 proposition. I'm passing to the AI a fully baked, multi-row, high dynamic range panorama, and saying, here, interpret this. In this way, surprise me. Um, other artists are starting with words and generating varieties of pictures and curating the best results. I think it's all interesting. And there's some. There's another uh, guy, a professor at Rutgers, Ahmed El Gamal, who has come up with an AI that actually can generate entirely new art movements based on other art movements. And uh, he he was the first person to have. Uh, an AI art show in New York City, um, he had to do a lot of curation because a lot of junk comes out when you do that, but he uh, put on a really nice show. Um, so, yeah. That's probably time for me to shut up. Enough about that. Do not disturb. Yeah, 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 Question. One is, how long does it take you to do this? So once you've got the photograph, how long does the whole process take? And the other thing is, can you duplicate exactly? Or is it always going to be different when you do the computer? Yeah, so can you, you make exactly that no, again? You, you can't make it exactly, but it'll be so close that me playing games like, uh, this, just so you know, big pieces are editions of one and one of a kind. So let's say, okay, so I'm going to make this, I'm going to charge a lot of money for this because it's one of a kind. And then I'm but I know that I can submit the exact same parameters and it will be slightly different. It won't be a pixel for pixel match. No, that's not fair. It's going to be so close. Uh, I would never do that. Um, but to answer your question, yes, it's never exactly the same. Okay. So now this is a hard question to answer. This, this is this because there's so many steps. You know, I'm one. My my next project will be a series of Central Park. Uh, works, branded dreamscapes, based on photography I shot in 2013 that I haven't, that really hasn't seen the light of day. Um, so, you know, there's flying to the place, setting up the shot, you know, finding the scenes, setting up the shot, taking the shots, pulling and, them together. And how long does a shot just take this? Oh, a typical capture uh, is even a, a my, my captures are typically anywhere from 24 to 81 photos. They happen in the space of about a minute to a minute and a half because you've got to work fast. I've got a shutter release cable. I'm set on auto exposure bracketing, so each view is chick, 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 three shots from dark to light. I quickly move it on a panoramic tripod head that can gauge it to, for perfect registration. Click, click, click. And the reason you have to work so fast is clouds are moving and stuff is happening. Uh, you, you don't want that to be smeared. And then the AI wants you. So then the AI, and then there's the process of, at low resolution, testing two, a dozen or two dozen or more examples, which can take several days. I, then I commit to the big job, which will take overnight. If I'm lucky, I get it right the first time. If I'm not, we go back to and the so drawing. The AI is, um, it is working on that image. For approximately eight hours? Um, it keeps getting faster. Okay. Uh, uh, scenes that used to take eight to 12 hours, in some cases, are taking 40 minutes to an hour now. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I'm doing more stuff and I'm double dosing them or triple dosing them. You know? um, so, no matter how powerful machines get, um, in almost 50 years of working com with computers, I still find myself waiting for them to. <laughs> I will always be waiting because I keep asking them to do more. Um, but yeah, I mean, to add it all up, you know, well, let's just say, you know, I shot these in April. I, had, I was in Oxford for 30 days. I only had eight days to shoot. And we opened last week. What's that? And we opened last week. And we opened last week. So, yeah. Um, 
I'm just, I'm, I just, 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 so there is a question about, can I come back to you? Yes. Um, yeah, at the back. Okay, so I was in here earlier um, today and I had a very, 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 very close look at your uh, pictures. And I noticed the fabric you were using yes. was very good quality. <coughs> um, I was just curious what fabric you were using to print on because it just... Yeah, so it, that's a good question and a great eye because I actually tried to get them done in England and unfortunately I couldn't find a match for the quality of the printer that I've been using um, in the States since 2016. So you can get these dye sublimation uh, prints on um, um, synthetic fabrics because it's a very high heat process in a lot of places. They're used in retail and, and elsewhere, but the quality is not the same everywhere. I did my research way back in 2015-16 and found a vendor who's using an Italian machine. They now have three of them and really high-end premium fabrics they source from Germany. And, you know, I tried, like, the best person I could find in England said, match this, and they couldn't get close. Uh, so, so Eduardo and, and the folks here at the gallery said, you know, quality matters the most. It doesn't matter if we have to ship them from there to here and ship them back. We do whatever it takes. Go with the best. And I see these are very durable. Right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, because this is a really high heat process, these fabrics are very robust. Um, they don't wrinkle. They don't crack. They don't fade. You can throw them in the washing machine. It's the same technique that's actually the same technology used in high-end women's fashion. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty amazing. Um, so I use the premium backlit fabric for both the backlit and frontlit work. The difference is that the backlit uh, color profile is darker because it's pumping up so much light. If we turn the lights off on these things, I can do this. It gets much darker. <coughs> so, you see, and so what they do is the same fabric, but um, if they printed it like that and put it on there, it would be really washed out. Um, here, and hopefully this works. Did that just turn off? Oh, no. There you go. Yeah, so it would be that dark. I mean, obviously you'd have some light on it, but it's just much darker, you know. Um, so they just change the color profile, depending upon whether they're back or front Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I was just really not on it. I just had a. I just wondered if you'd sort of say taking one photograph and doing six different computer versions of it. So having a show which was the same photograph, but but each of them sort of changed in some different way. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, if you go through my Instagram feed, you have to go back a few years. I've experimented with stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of fun. I use three different computer graphics packages. Ah. I use um, uh, um, Auto Pano Pro to stitch the frames together. Uh, but before I do that, I blend the multiple exposures together with Aurora HDR. Um, mm -hmm. And then I go in Photoshop and I um, uh, crop and sweeten them. By sweeten them, I mean usually I just um, uh, do a little bit of level adjustment to take out the haze. Uh, there is another step. I don't know if anyone saw the um, tweet I, I put out there about being excited to come here tonight. I threw, out, threw in a bunch of emojis. An airplane, a hiking boot, a camera, a computer, a robot, a paint palette, and then a painted picture. The paint palette at the end is the last thing I do. The AI does do a fair amount of color shifting, uh, which isn't always desirable. Some layers more so than others. You get these pinks and purples and greens that are a little too much. Uh, so the, one of the, last, the, the last steps I do is I modulate that. Sometimes I want to keep some of it. Sometimes I don't want any of it. So I use some Photoshop tricks to um, work with the luminosity, whoever is in a Photoshop uh, jockey would know I work with the luminosity channels to uh, take down that, that color shifting. Could I comment that you seem to be rather in control of the AI, which is, it's meant to be artificial intelligence, but you, it's your intelligence that's telling yeah. you what to do. Well, well, that's the part that, 
that where the surprise and the delight is. I can set the direction of the AI, but I can't control the details. So setting the direction is literally a matter of choosing five things. First and foremost, which of the 84 layers of the neural network I'm going to operate on. And each one of those 84 layers generates a different overall motif. At the highest levels, when it's just starting to process the image, it's just making little curves and little uh, shapes. As you go deeper, it gets more literal and animalistic, and, and birds and, and animals, things it was trained on, literally emerge. And I've got pictures on my website like of uh, forest scenes that look like a forest from a distance. You get up close and it's, it's filled with these AI creatures that are like its idea of what a bird looks like and an amphibian and stuff. It's not copy and pasted, it's just crazy. Um, and sometimes I, I prefer the higher, more ab abstract sort of impressions, but every once in a while it makes sense to go deep like that. So that's the first thing I choose. Then I have four sliding parameters that control the scale and the intensity of the dreaming. So I like to say that this combination of five things that I set gives me an infinite amount of variety within a finite repertoire of motifs. So it's a kind of a bounded infinity, all right? Uh, so I have a lot of options for how to set the overall look, but then it does the rest. And, and I, can't, I can't, I choose not to try to change any particular part of the scene. The AI just goes for it. And in the process, um, when I open it up the next day, I'm often surprised by some things I didn't expect. A great example was a beach scene that I, I, I brought here when I was showing the guys an example of a frontlet fabric. Um, there was this little girl in this tide pool. Um, uh, you can see her reflection in the water. And it was really coarsely dreamed in a very impressionistic way. But what was awesome was it blended her head and hair into her left arm and her shirt into her right arm. And it was a very creative, it was really, it was quite creative. The, the way, I would never have thought of this. And, and it just really added a lot to the scene. Um, or, and that's the kind of thing that's Or, or a gold, gold star for anyone who spots the fried egg in uh, Sheffield Park. Oh, yeah. Look for the fried egg. You, you, you win a cookie. <laughs> or a fried egg. Or a fried egg. <laughs> um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I, I wonder if there's no last questions. I'm, I'm conscious of time. And I think it's been a, an amazing discussion. We're in all sorts of directions. Um, we'll probably finish there. but. Feel free to stay for you know ten minutes or so, wandering around, coming to ask us any questions. Um, but I think, well, really, a round of applause is due for. Dan <laughs>